you for joining us today. My name is Jody Lee, and I will be the moderator on this webinar, Machine Learning, Automate Remote Sensing Analytics to Gain a Competitive Advantage. I'm excited to be joined today by Pedro Rodriguez, Solutions Engineer at Harris, and Will Rohr, Machine Learning Business Development at Harris. Just a couple of housekeeping items. I've muted all the phone lines for our attendees. Um, so if you have any questions at any point during the webinar, feel free to enter them into the questions chat box, and our presenters will try to answer as many as they can at the end of their presentation. We are recording this webinar today. We will email you a link to the recording as well as a PDF of the presentation in the next 24 hours. It will also be available online at www.harrisgeospatial.com, and we encourage you to share it with your colleagues. And without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our first speaker, Pedro. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Pedro Rodriguez. And today, Will Royer and I will host this webinar about applying machine learning to remote sensing analytics. In the agenda today, Will is going to start off by giving a brief overview of Harris Corporation and Harris Geospatial Solutions. Then he'll give a quick overview of, of what is deep learning and for those of you that are new to the subject. He's then going to provide uh, background information on machine learning at Harris, which started as an internal investment and is now commercially available. We will also discuss the importance of label data in deep learning and discuss ongoing research. Then I'll, I'll, continue, I'll continue the webinar by presenting some of the solutions we have developed using deep learning for our customers. And then we'll end up with a Q&A. Okay, great. Yeah, this is Will Rohr, and I'll, I'll start us off with the uh, uh, orientation of, of Harris Corporation. Just a couple slides on who we are. Harris Corporation is a worldwide organization with customers in more than 100 countries. Uh, we have about 21,000 employees, 9,000 of which are engineers and scientists, so a very heavy uh, research and development uh, focus in the company. Under Harris Corporation, we're divided into four segments, communication systems, space and intelligence, critical networks, and electronic systems. We're speaking to you from the space and intelligence systems uh, segment. Uh, this segment is uh, focused on intelligence surveillance reconnaissance type of uh, applications uh, for DOD, Intel, and commercial entities. Inside of the space and intelligence segment, uh, specifically, we're, we are in the Harris Geospatial Solutions group. Um, our expertise is in applying advanced geospatial technology to solve hard problems. Organizations from across industries rely on our in-depth knowledge of advanced geospatial analytics, machine learning, and remote sensed data to make better decisions. We have uh, decades of experience in applying uh, in-depth knowledge to, to sensor models in, uh, in performing analytics of their products. Uh, some of you may be familiar with our products. For those that you aren't, here's a quick overview of some of the products we offer inside of this, this group. Envy is a geospatial image and data analysis software solution. We use that to extract meaningful information from all types of geospatial data so businesses and organizations can make more informed decisions. It's known for its advanced analytics and a powerful API that makes it easy to extend, customize, and automate the tool to fit a variety of needs. Uh, another one of our commercial products is Jaguar. This is a web-based solution. It enhances situational awareness provided by providing geographically dispersed teams with on-demand access to critical geospatial intelligence. Uh, the tool set's been designed from the, from the ground up to uh, focus on low bandwidth dissemination. Uh, it's been uh, battle proven overseas for the DoD and Intel communities and is expanding into uh, commercial areas. Additionally, we also offer Geiger Mode LiDAR. Uh, we're the, the only commercial provider of a, a Geiger mode LiDAR sensor. It's ideal for collecting point clouds over very large geographic areas, I think on the scale of a city or even statewide collections. It can be delivered with point densities up to 100 points per meter, uh, much higher than linear mode uh, Geiger. Because of the scale and density of these point clouds, uh, these collections can be used as a foundation for current and future products, projects. Uh, finally, our geospatial marketplace provides access to the best commercially available satellite and aerial imagery from a single online source. Uh, we provide a variety of data-derived products 
that range from simple image orthorectification to sophisticated uh, viz and sim models. Uh, so that's a, a quick orientation of where we're at in the company and which group uh, you're speaking with here. And then we'll, we'll dive into uh, some, some deep learning here. Uh, but first, we have the, the first poll question to kind of understand what, uh, what the audience makeup is here. Okay, what is the level of deep learning implementation in your organization? Please vote. All right, as the votes have come in, we were spread, we had the question spread through not yet doing research evaluating solutions, uh, starting phase prototyping and fully operational. It looks like the group is more heavily focused on the, uh, the early side of that, which is kind of to be expected in, uh, in deep learning's place in the market right now, uh, but it's rapidly expanding into the field. So we had 37% not yet, 39% doing research and evaluating solutions and uh, 16 and 8 percent respectively in the more advanced phases. We'd expect over the next couple of years, as you'll see when I start talking about the, the background of deep, lear deep learning, that this is going to um, be an underlying technology of just about uh, every marketplace and every industry. All right, with that, we'll step into uh, the background of deep learning just to, to set the stage. Uh, so deep learning is a, a series of algorithm, algorithms that learn multiple levels of abstraction to make sense of any type of data, uh, such as images, sound, text, video, etc. Uh, in fact, it's data agnostic. Deep learning is a type of machine learning and is key in helping some of the most challenging problems. So inside the broader uh, technology base of machine learning, you have an area of neural networks and then Stacking those neural networks uh, into deep layers is, is the focus of deep learning there. The learning architecture of deep learning uh, is motivated by artificial intelligence to emulate deep layered learning process of the human brain. Uh, the, the biological neurons uh, of our brain have been mathematically modeled as an artificial uh, neuron uh, to, form, to form deep layered networks. Artificial intelligence has been around for decades but it's been reinvigorated in the, in the last few years due to the increase in computing power, uh, specifically GPUs, reduced cost of storage, availability of training data, the whole big data uh, uh, concept, and new training, training techniques with the deep learning models. As I mentioned, deep learning is being applied uh, in a wide range of technologies, uh, be it in object detection, uh, most heavily in social media type of applications, uh, forward-facing photos, identifying objects inside of, of pictures taken from cam um, cameras and cell phones, uh, applying it to automated, automatic language translation, translating one language to another on the fly, whether from voice or from text, in the social media uh, and online shopping areas. Uh, there's a lot of advances in understanding consumer behavior. Uh, E-commerce commerce vendors like Amazon use search patterns, time spent per item, search frequency, and purchase items to make buying suggestions to the users. Uh, deep learning applications continue to grow since more data has been created in the last two years than the entire history of the human race, and at the moment only 0.5% of that data is ever analyzed or used. There's potential for many deep learning applications as we're already seeing across all the industries. It's fair to say deep learning is no longer a novel technology, but absolutely necessary to keep up with the introduction of new sensors and data, data like we're seeing in the ISR community with the, the advent of uh, small satellite providers. Deep learning is definitely going to help with the large volume of data manageable uh, and to be able to extract useful information. So how it's been used across a bunch of different industries and a bunch of different applications, what we're doing specifically at Harris is applying it to the intelligence surveillance, surveillance reconnaissance, in general, the remote sensing uh, problem set. And so the investment at Harris has been going on for about five years. It's a multi-million dollar investment at this point. Uh, we've been applying the state-of-the-art deep learning technologies to our specific customer problem sets, like I said, in remote sensing. And we are uh, in the process of commercializing that investment through a uh, customized solution uh, offering. 
Our investment approach has been divided across four areas. Uh, number one, research, keeping up with the, uh, the the latest academic developments, contributing back to that with our with our own publications, uh, right at the bleeding edge of the of the technology. What we learn there and shake out as as feasible, we take into pilot projects. This will this is where we will preliminarily uh, test out the application of deep learning to a new data set. Uh, not every case is, is deep learning the, the best solution, but this is where we'll test it out and see if it's uh, got a benefit over top of traditional mechanisms. And from there, we'll take it into software tool development, raise the TRL level up and up to where it's available for uh, laboratory type of uses. And, and then additionally, as I mentioned with our other commercial products, we do have a commercial off-ramp to, to take it up to a fully operational uh, commercialized offering. As far as the, the Technology areas we're looking at in our investment, it, it breaks out into four areas there as well. Uh, number one is reducing the cost of training. Uh, the, the deep learning technology, while it provides fantastic uh, accuracies that haven't been achievable with previous uh, traditional techniques, uh, it does come at the, the expense of having to have a lot of example data to train your neural network. And so we've been investing in novel techniques to, to get around this label data burden. I've got a slide on that later. Extensibility, the tools that we're making, we're, we're specifically designing them to be able to deploy to either desktop or enterprise environments, uh, cloud capable right from the beginning, uh, being able to swap in and out existing uh, open source deep, deep learning engines such as the Ano Cafe Torch, TensorFlow, and so on. Uh, we're, we're making those plug and play with our, with our API. Uh, additionally, we're looking at multi-int, um, multiple different types of data to look at with deep learning, uh, whether that's uh, where we started was with uh, 2D overhead electro-optical imagery, but we're expanding that into a variety of different data modalities. I'll touch on that uh, on another slide. And then automation, we're, we're looking at tying these uh, automated detects into workflows that can take further steps of bringing the human out of the loop not necessarily to replace the, the analyst, but save their time from the mundane task of, of searching uh, for, for objects they're interested in in imagery and save that for, for higher cognitive decisions once the detections are made. Um, next I'll talk about the uh, label data burden that I, that I mentioned. Um, the, the, the phrase around the industry these days is label data is a new currency. That is, is what's going to to uh, enable deep learning in many aspects. In the uh, commercial market, social media, online activity, there's been uh, numerous data sets that have been well curated to allow the community to train their neural networks. One of the best examples of that is the ImageNet Challenge that's uh, sponsored every, uh, that's held every year since 2010. Uh, that consists of a uh, a well curated data set, 1.2 million images that are divided into a thousand different object categories and every year the, uh, the competition sees the, the best, best of breed models that can identify every object in those, those categories. Um, the, the revolution in deep learning is best uh, represented by the spike in improvement there really in the 2012 time frame which was the, the first introduction of a convolutional neural network with a, with, powered by a GPU. And we saw a, an increase of over 10% um, in the, the accuracy or 10% reduction in the, the error uh, of the winning solution there. That's really what, what caught the, the attention of the entire industry. And most recently in 2016, the latest winner achieved a, an error rate of 3%. Notably, that hap uh, uh, as happened last year, we are now exceeding performance of a human level each time this ImageNet challenge is held, they have a, a human control performing the, the te detections alongside the uh, the machine algorithm, and the the human had averaged five percent error rate. And so both the the 15 and 16 winners are now well below uh, human on the error rate. But I bring all of that up to say that that's possible in the in that type of challenge because of the volume of training data provided and a well curated set. When we are applying deep learning to uh, ISR uh, remote sensing problems, specifically overhead imagery, there's not a lot of well-curated labeled data sets out there. 
And so we've been investing in techniques to get around having to have that much uh, that much data to train the algorithms, yet still get the same high performance results. And so the type of things we've been looking at there, number one is transfer learning and pre-training. So this is the concept of training a neural network either on a completely different uh, object than what you're looking for, that, or what you're about to build a classifier for, or just in general training and about the world uh, at a low level. The model picks up low level features, understands how to see the world, and then when you go to train a, a new algorithm, you're not having to provide as many examples of the, the new, new targets you're looking for. Additionally, unsupervised training methods, uh, the very similar type of technique without any, any supervision. We're not pro providing it any label data, but letting, letting the algorithm learn about the world in general. Uh, number three, we've been looking at curriculum learning. There is a, uh, a technique when, when training these algorithms on what type of data you provide to it in what order. Um, anytime you're training a, a neural network, you at minimum are going to be providing it positive and negative examples of what you're looking for, but additionally you're going to give it hard positives and hard negatives, things that, that may be confusing to the algorithm. The order in which you, you train the, the neural net has an impact on how fast it converges. So we've been doing a lot of research there. Number four, uh, synthetic data generation. So this is the concept of I don't have an actual image of the, the target I'm trying to identify with my algorithm, but I may use uh, tools such uh, tools that can synthesize uh, imagery of that target. And so I never really had a, an actual image of it, but I can generate photorealistic versions of it that the neural net can learn from, and then go out and search actual imagery and uh, and find that target. Additionally, augmentation, a more simple form of that than, than synthetic generation, is uh, taking the, the few images we have and we'll, we'll augment them with uh, rotations, jitter, uh, and other, other types of uh, uh, mechanisms to expand our data set. And then the fifth one is just purely the brute force method, uh, crowdsourcing the collection of label data. Uh, we have leverage techniques, techniques such as uh, the online mechanical terp application through Amazon Web Services. Uh, and this farms out the, the task of identifying targets that uh, that we would then take over and, and train our neural nets, as well as the wealth of information available in OpenStreet uh, OpenStreetMaps tags. Um, so that is much of where we have been investing, and we've already rolled into our, our technology tool set where we're where we're looking forward, where we're going here. Um, we're continuing to expand our deep learning applications into new data types. Again, we started with electro-optical overhead maybe three years ago. That was uh, you know, a completely novel uh, uh, technique, as we've shown in the 2012 uh, ImageNet. Shortly after that, folks started applying it to, to satellite imagery. We're now expanding that to other data types, such as point clouds, uh, radar collections, uh, type of their HSI, hyperspectral information, uh, vector data sets, as well as even uh, cyber type of information. Um, with those various different types of data sets, we're, we're looking at models that include multiple input sources. And so this is tying together a variety of modalities, whether that's imagery and, moda imagery and metadata, uh, LIDAR and electro-optical, electro-optical and open street maps, et cetera, all sorts of combinations to make a, a more synergistic solution or answer that you could not get from any one of the individual data sets by themselves. Uh, a new area that we're looking at, and this has got a lot of attention in the, uh, the most recent 2016 NIPS conference, is the generative adversarial networks. We're looking at that from two different angles. Uh, this is where you're using uh, neural nets that have been trained up uh, through, a, through a variety of pre-training and unsupervised learning techniques to actually be able to generate imagery from that. Uh, the imagery you gener generate from those um, adversarial networks can can help you twofold. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, label, label data augmentation, you're synthesizing new, uh, new imagery there. Uh, but in addition, uh, looking at it from the other side of anti-spoofing of models, in the USGIF uh, machine learning conference a couple weeks ago, it was, a, it was a big topic with the DOD and Intel communities on how to protect neural nets from being spoofed uh, by images that have been modified in some way. Uh, 
uh, generative adversarial networks look like they will provide a, uh, a path into that, that problem set. Additionally, we're looking at meta-learning, meta uh, so this concept of unsupervised automatic model optimization. We're using advanced computation, computational techniques to uh, optimize the, the parameters and the, the model architecture prior to, to training for a classifier. And so instead of having, uh, having to have PhDs design the, the model architecture that you will, you will, you will then go train, uh, we're looking at an automated process for, for designing that architecture. That brings us to poll question number two. Okay, what type of area are you considering applying deep learning to? Transportation, utilities, agriculture, defense and intelligence, or other? Please vote now. Okay, so we have the results in. It looks like there's a 4% in transportation, 10% in utilities, 29% in agriculture, about 20% in defense and intelligence, and then 40% other. Uh, as to be expected, and kind of as I mentioned on the, uh, the the rollout of deep learning to all the industries, there is a an underlying theme here. It can be applied in a variety of techniques across, across all industries. Um, so taking this to our next section, Pedro will show us uh, some of the specific examples we've had in applying deep learning to uh, ISR remote sensing problems. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Will. So before I start briefing about some of the custom solutions that we have developed using deep learning, I want, I want to provide an overview of the process that we typically follow with new customers that are looking into applying deep learning to their particular industry. As a solutions engineer at Harris, my main goal is to understand a customer's problem and use all the available tools to prototype a custom solution that could be refined and further developed as an industry solution. Typically, businesses are collecting or receiving um, data faster than it can be analyzed to make critical business decisions. To overcome this challenge, automation of analytics is needed. We achieve this by receiving customer feedback to identify what's the best data um, to solve that specific problem. In some cases, the data is already provided by the customer, but in other cases, the data is either missing or not appropriate for the problem set, like run resolution or number of bands. We provide expert guidance on how to select the most optimal data. If this is the case, we have um, Harris MapMart, which provides access to a marketplace for searching new spatial data from multiple data vendors and data types, like satellite and drone imagery, lighting point cloud, vector data, elevation data, all of which can be combined to provide a more synergistic solution. Once the appropriate data has been identified, the next step is to migrate that large volume of data to our enterprise analytics, which includes more than 160 pre-built tasks, including deep learning tasks that we are highlighting in this webinar. One of the main benefits of implementing an enterprise solution like this is that data is already available for processing at the computing node, meaning that there's no need to download any data to a local disk, no need for software installation, or needing a thick client computer to perform the exploitation workflow. As Will mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, Harris brings decades of experience developing and applying geospatial technologies to our solutions, with customers ranging from government agencies and commercial organizations. For the final step, I want to emphasize that we're not merely delivering software on a disk, but an end-to-end -end solution that delivers answer, answers to specific problems. For this reason, it is critical that we establish a, co a close partnership with our customers to share industry expertise and insight about the problems to answer questions like, how many utility poles need servicing, which blades in a wind farm have damage, or how are the roads near me? All of these questions we have been able to accurately answer for our customers. I'll be I'm talking more about this in the in the next slide. So starting with the basic automatic target detection, we achieved 
near ceiling performance using panchromatic, RGB, and multispectral imagery. On the next sample, we, we trained uh, an airplay finder with high resolution imagery from, from different sources, including Econos, QuickBird, WebView2, and GOI satellite imagery. After running the, the airplane finder uh, through a panchromatic image of the Tokyo International Airport, we were able to find 20 of the 20 planes with only one false positive. On the right sample, we achieved similar results after training a cross rock classifier with a 30 centimeter world view 3 image from the Eater Globe in Sao Paulo, Brazil. 43 out of the 43 cross rocks were found with zero false positives. I was actually really impressed with these results because it required very little training data and it still correctly distinguished real crosswalks from similar role markings, like, like this on this side. They also identified crosswalks that were partially hidden in, uh, in the shadows. On the same theme, uh, there's actually a, another example to, that shows how robust deep learning is um, in, the, in the crosswalks. It, it didn't get confused with any other similar markings, and it also identified a crosswalk that is partially blurred or faded from the, from the street. In all the tests, the accuracy ranged from 95 to 97 percent. We also tested with other targets like storage tanks, swimming pools, stadiums, all with very high accuracy in the upper 90 percent. This is one of our most basic solutions, which usually involves searching for a particular feature in large data sets. Um, therefore, it's applicable to many real-world challenges. I'll show you how we were able to monitor airport traffic using the same techniques here, automatic target detection, later in the webinar. In this next solution, which is actually operational today as a commercial product, we applied deep learning techniques to enhance the accuracy of a high-risk product called Helios. Helios is a real-time, hyper-local weather intelligence system that uses traffic cameras to determine road conditions to answer questions like, is it raining? Are the roads wet? Is it no present? To then display that information in a web app. Essentially, Helio converts a camera network into a weather sensor network. Um, current customers are using Helio's API to improve weather forecasting models, traffic routing and logistic planning, and support navigation for the next generation of autonomous vehicles. Not only did deep learning improve the accuracy of the scene detection to nearly 99%, and reduce the false alarm rate to 2%, but it now requires a single video frame to determine both conditions, which translated into a 87% cost reduction in processing and data transfer, two very important factors in cloud-based deployments that charge on a per-use basis. This demo video was shown last week during the 2017 consumer electronics show in Las Vegas. The Helios team partnered with Clarion and Subaru to show that the same deep, deep learning techniques that Helios uses to determine road conditions with traffic cameras can be used with vehicle cameras to detect and notify drivers about weather conditions. In this case, Helios is turning cars into mobile weather stations that can share information with other cars to increase driving safety. Clarion manufactures Subaru's eyesight cameras, which in the near future will include embedded deep learning analytics like Helios to power autonomous vehicles. In the next solution, we perform 3D object detection from terrestrial-based LiDAR point clouds after the European Union mandated countries to identify and geolocate their railroad assets, we work with a European company to perform asset inventory. The terrestrial base ladder sensors were mounted on the train, collecting data along the tracks to later extract a variety of 3D objects, like signal towers, crossings, poles, etc. We also have applied the same 3D feature extraction to point clouds generated from EO stereo pairs instead of terrestrial base lighter, like in this case, with very similar results. 
as Will mentioned earlier, having high quality label data is critical. However, in some cases, training data can be scarce or non-existent. In this solution, we use synthetic data to train the, the deep learning uh, neural network using uh, cap models of fighter jets. For this, we use DIRSEC, which is a product from our academic partner, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, DIRSEC uh, uses the cap model of an object and the radiometric model of a sensor to synthesize an image of an object. It's very powerful um, because it generates training data for an object that didn't really exist before. The goal was to train the deep learning model with synthetic data um, to then run the classification on the real data. Using synthetic data, we achieve very similar results to training with real data in the over 90% of accuracy. In this solution, we use deep learning for land cover classification to automatically identify bare ground, water, vegetation, buildings, like any type of buildings, um, commercial, industrial, or residential structures, and transportation classes, which include roads, firewalks, and parking lots. If you're familiar with image science, land cover classification is typically done by spectral mapping, using a workflow that uses fine sharpening, quack, or quick atmospheric correction, and finally applying SAM, or a spectral angle mapper, which basically classify each pixel by comparing the spectral angle to a known spectral library to determine the type of material, if it's water, vegetation, etc. One di on disadvantage of SAM is that any spectral anomaly in the pixels can result in a misclassification, especially with those materials that are spectrally similar, like buildings, and transportation subclasses like sidewalks, which in mo most cases are made from the same materials, they can be really easy to classify. The image in the middle shows a, a sample SAM analysis of a complex scene in Melbourne, Florida. In this case, the misclassi misclassification problem is very clear, as noted by the unclear outlines of the building, especially um, and the scattered pixels in the image. As you can see on the right image, deep learning handles these spectral differences much better. This is mainly because it learns directly from the data, so basically it adopts the, any anomaly bias. For example, if the water has a strange spectral signature, it learns directly from that anomaly. In this sense, it doesn't depend on a predefined and static spectral library. As you can see from the confusion matrix here on the top, deep learning um, had about 80% classification accuracy for all classes. These results are significantly improvement over SAM analysis. For example, in the building classification, SAM only classified 38% of the buildings, and in using deep learning, classified 87 and 11% um, of the buildings. That was actually a 48% improvement from typical spectral mapping. I'm um, taking a closer look at land cover classification, which could be used in many industries. What seemed like a very complex scene now becomes much more manageable in a factor of the time by identifying each of the five classes. This classification product that is seen on the screen can be used with other available data, like existing vector data or mapping services to find solutions in many use cases like, for example, um, urban planning, by like comparing building density over the years, extracting roads to analyze uh, on transportation networks, or we can be used for disaster recovery, like flood analysis, comparing the presence of water between two scenes. Um, for forestry, it can be used to monitor um, deforestation, and as you can imagine, many other applications. This new solution was developed by our Harris UK office for a customer who was interested in doing automatic feature extraction and gaining activity-based intelligence from a dashboard without any human interaction. Even though this solution can be applied to any classifier, the goal in this use case was to monitor airplane traffic in the London South End Airport. The first step was to um, perform a daily ingest of one meter resolution chromatic imagery from Warview 2 to then perform automatic feature extraction to find the planes. 
Next, a database was populated with destructive features to include acquisition time, location, confidence level, etc. And to then automatically build a dashboard with that information. On taking a closer look at the dashboard, we can see that um, users can select the time frame where they want to see the, the quantity of plane. It shows the total number of planes. It also breaks it down by uh, daily plane count. Um, it also shows a plane, um, a plane change graph that um, it actually allows users to um, baseline uh, normal air airport traffic and easily detect any anomaly on the baseline traffic of the airport. For example, during the spike showing the graph, it was later confirmed that air show was hosted at the airport during that time frame. Here below, it also shows a heat map for airplane locations. And this shows um, what areas of the airport um, experience higher traffic conditions. In this use case, we automatically build the dashboard to, mo to monitor airport traffic. But this same concept can be applied to any object classifier to monitor illicit airfields or to monitor crops, for example. It can be also be used with any data at any scale. It can be used to monitor a very small area of interest or an entire region. In this next solution, we partnered with Edge Data to build a custom solution called Blade Edge that automatically performs turbine blade inspection in wind farms using images from UAVs. UAVs are also known as drones. It has been estimated that blade degradation in these turbines can cost up to 25% efficiency loss and even more in maintenance costs if these defects are not resolved in a timely manner. Unfortunately, blade inspections are typically costly, time consuming, and sometimes unsafe. Blade Edge is, is able to quickly process thousands of images with more than a 90% confidence to determine a blade, blade condition rating and answer, answer the critical business question which turbines need repair in this wind farm. Now we're going to take a closer look at this Edge dashboard. One of the most attractive features in this dashboard is that, is that it allows users to quickly track turbine conditions over time and automate maintenance planning. In the upper left, it provides the ability to download an inspection report with details about the blade conditions and previous history to include type, date, type, and turbine. This section of the UI also lists all three blades. A, B, and C, and each, each of the four sides of those blades, like the high pressure, um, low pressure, leading edge, and trailing edge. The combined, the compiled thumbnails shown below make up one side of the blade, in this case, the high pressure side of blade A, and it will correlate to a position on the mosaic above. If you click on a thumbnail, it will show a high resolution JPEG of that section of the blade um, here. On the, on, the, on the right. Users also have the option to download the full quality raw image from the MR, MRI link shown here. This is an example of a high resolution image um, that is reporting the, the damage. So you can, it's very easy to, to do the inspection using this tool. It also performs a, a full assessment um, analysis, which is based on 19 different damage types um, to include landing strikes, bird impact, uh, degradation from harsh on weather conditions, and from bullets. Yes, people actually shoot uh, with turbines. After the assessment is completed, it provides a standard EPRI code uh, to categorize the damage. In this case, it's a 2, which means um, major cosmetic damage, as you can see in the image here. As you can imagine, um, this solution not only reduces the maintenance cost significantly and increases the inspection frequency to guarantee high efficiency in the turbines, but it also increases the security of the personnel and allows them to focus on uh, focus their attention on repairing the damaged blade. As you can see, there are many industries in, in which we can provide very valuable solutions. Um, bring us a problem, um, the data if you have it, uh, and we'll scope out the possibilities based on our experience. That's it for my presentation, but stay tuned um, for the last poll question and the Q&A to follow after that.
Okay, the last poll question. Based on based on the custom solutions presented in this webinar, can deep learning provide a solution to your specific problem? All right, and here are the answers. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so it, it looks very promising. So only 3% is not applicable, 37% um, somewhat applicable, 36% applicable, and 34% very applicable. So, you know, like, you know, I think like it's a common theme throughout the presentation that, um, you know, in order to stay competitive um, in the next 10 years, I think machine learning will be very crucial to any business, um, you know, including industries ranging from agriculture, transportation, um, even cybersecurity, defense, you know, pretty much every industry will be involved in machine learning at some point. So um, definitely, if you have a problem, we'll be glad to um, provide consultation and, and see how we can help. Pedro, are you having a hard time going to the next slide? Okay, great. Um, thank you guys for the fascinating presentation. At this point, Will and Pedro will address some of the questions that have come in. Um, as a reminder, you can type the qu your question into the question area of your GoToWebinar dashboard. So with that, our first question is, are your synthetic data generation tools homegrown or commercially available applications? Yeah, this is Will. I'll take that one. So in, in our initial work with that, you know, we are using the, uh, the tool set from one of our academic partners, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, uh, and that's their, their DeerSig product. Uh, with our, our future research there, we may move into some of our own synthetic, uh, depending on on where things pan out with generative adversarial networks. Great, thank you. Um, this question pertains to the poll question number two um, about the industries. Were those poll numbers in line with what you were expecting or um, what your research is showing for high growth areas? Yeah, absolutely. This The polls reacted very much how I thought the uh, thought the audience would look, you know, but it's a, it's a great confirmation. Basically spread out between industries? That's mm -hmm. correct, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, the next question is, how do your automatic target detection results vary with higher ground samples distances and satellite imagery? Is there a minimum GSD for using target detection? Yeah, great. So it, it, it's a fantastic question. It it does depend on what targets you're going after. Um, you know, I think it's one of the challenges when we start looking at small sat data providers. Typically, those are at lower GSD. And so if you're if you're looking at three to five meter resolution, um, you're you're not going to be able to pick out things that would only have a, a few pixels on them. So you do need uh, you know a certain minimum set of pixels on target to to train an algorithm. Um, you see a lot more robustness with deep learning than compared to traditional, you know, SVM type of techniques, but you still at least have to have some pixels on target to make a, uh, a hierarchy of features to uh, to make a determination there. Mm -hmm. I can also add, like, for example, on the crosswalk um, classifier, you know, we use some 30 centimeter data to be able to find those. Um, if you're using uh, lower GSD, maybe like five, seven meter, maybe we can identify communication towers, maybe airfields. Um, so it, it all depends on the target that you're trying to identify. Great. And the next question, can these systems be used with aerial photography instead of satellite imagery? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> we have tried it out with a, a variety of different uh, image types, whether it's from a, from a satellite, from a drone, or from a, a, 
an, an airborne sensor. Uh, so absolutely same technique. Great. Um, have you applied deep learning to insurance verticals, for example, um, like claims? Um, like, is it real roof damage versus normal wear and tear? Have you done anything like that? Uh, we, we do have some initial work in that, that area. Um, we're looking at the, uh, the, the different inputs to the um, wide area insurance uh, claim adjustments. I had some early work that, uh, that, that we don't have prepared to show today, but yes, uh, the insurance market is, is interested in this, uh, this application. Great. Um, do you have a report or published paper on the related study, the CNN, that you showed in your PowerPoint, um, so they can get more technical details? Uh, we, we do have some information we can share, and we're certainly happy to, uh, to arrange a, a follow-up meeting uh, to discuss that. Great. Um, was any manual or semi-automated cleanup performed for the land cover classification examples? Were the classification results straight out of the algorithm? Yeah, no. The the, the results that we showed there did not have the uh, did not have post processing. We did go on to do some post processing to to try and put some some polygons and shape files on it. But no, the the results we showed were straight out of the algorithm. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I also want to add that in, in that particular case, you know, we, it's very easy for us to extract um, you know, every single class. You know, if if our customer is interested in extracting roads only or buildings or just the vegetation, for example. Uh, we can easily uh, create vector files out of those that are georeferenced, and it can be used with any other um, um, analysis tools. So. Okay. Uh, so the next question is: I would expect deep learning using the vehicle camera to be able to inform me of weather conditions likely to occur against weather conditions while I'm driving through it. Um, but is it? Is there a way using deep learning while driving to gain knowledge about a location where I'm heading to? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's still in in, in implementation phase, but the, the goal is to create a network of uh, of these sensors, right? So, um, you know, now cars can communicate with each other. So, you know, once a car picks up, a, you know, a wet road or snow, um, it can communicate to the network of those cars, and they will, you know. Already know um, like what are the road conditions in the in the environment. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it's going to be um, critical, you know, to have these cars communicating. Um, I mean, essentially, they're mobile on weather stations um, once they, they have that technology installed in the cameras. Great. The next question: How was labeled data obtained for this wind turbine problem? Right, so we work closely with the um, with the uh, uh, the client there. They're actually flying the the drones themselves and collecting it. So in this case, it was very much a, a manual process of reviewing the the drone footage, pulling out what uh, what were known defects, uh, because the 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 client had been manually doing this. Their client had been manually doing this. We knew what to look for manually, um, and pull those out, label them, and then train. Here's an interesting question. Do you have any experience with wildlife detection and tracking? We did have some early work on that. Uh, there were some, uh, some nonprofit groups that were interested in um, uh, monitoring um, at-risk uh, species in, in Africa from aerial imagery. Uh, it was only some very preliminary work, but it very much fell in the same category of Identifying a target from an overhead image, so uh, we're still very well adapted to, to this type of technology. Yeah, I mean, in that case, it's going to be very similar to the to the activity-based intelligence that we use for monitoring airplanes. Um, you know, maybe we have we can have a higher um, frequency of the images taken. Um, you know, when that particular animal is known to be in that area, um, so it'd be easy to um, 
baseline their activity in that area with that information. Perfect. Um, somebody wants to know if you're developing your own machine learning language, or are you working with TensorFlow, Piano, et cetera? Right. No, we are not developing a, a deep learning engine. Um, and uh, that was uh, one of the areas I, I mentioned we were focused on as far as uh, extensibility um, in our software development. So we, our, our model is to provide a, an API that is specifically tuned for the overhead use of these tools. Out of the box, a lot of them are more tuned to the forward-facing, um, you know, hand camera type of pictures that you see in social media. Uh, we've developed an API to sit over top of that, that that makes each of these tool sets more applicable to a, a remote sensing type of application. But no, we're not creating a deep learning engine under the hood. Great, thank you. Um, next question, will deep learning methods be available as a classification tool within NV? We are in the process of, of using them in NV. Uh, we have some, some aftermarket, aftermarket uh, add-in extensions there. Um, still, still being determined what's going to be included native, natively in the product, uh, but we have, have been calling them as extensions from NV already. Great. Um, next question, can machine learning be applied to geophysical data for finding known targets and from numerical models? I will say hypothetically yes. I can't say that we've done that ourselves, uh, but, it, but in general the, the application of deep learning, anything that can be represented as, a, as an array is a, is a valid use of this data. And, and that's where I was showing, we've been focusing in uh, electro-optical remote sensing areas, but you can see the application to uh, voice uh, analysis, uh, translational language, text-based, um, even the cybersecurity stuff. So it doesn't just have to be pictures or photographs. There is a wide application of anything that can be represented as an array, and even the combination of those things uh, to feed to a, a deep learning network. Um, kind of go into that synergistic uh, decision that Pedro had mentioned. Great. A couple more questions. Um, how long did it take for the deep learning process for the land cover classification? I don't know that I have the background. Do you have that? No, I don't have the background. Okay. Yeah. I, I can tell in general, um, okay, I'll, make, I'll make the comment about uh, deep learning and processing speed in terms of training and then classification. Um, deep learning is powered by, by GPUs. NVIDIA has, has led the market there with the, the best of breed GPUs, specifically tuned for deep learning. You're going to see about a 10x improvement uh, if you were doing a deep learning task on a CPU versus on a GPU. You'll see a 10x improvement in, in performance there. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the, uh, the API we've, des we've designed has been uh, made to handle parallel processing, so we can take advantage of multiple GPUs, multiple CPUs. Um, when you're talking about a relatively simple task, uh, say the, the, the crosswalk finder we did with the digital globe rubber three imagery, this is the, the type of thing, even with a CPU, you can train in a few hours. Um, you get GPUs and you're, you're retraining very quickly um, in, in minutes. On, on that type of target. The more, the more variation in the target, the more uh, widely you want to find it in different areas, you're going you're gonna to see higher iterations needed to converge and get a crisp decision. Um, but the, you know, it, it's kind of an it depends answer, and you'll greatly see a benefit from using uh, GPUs and reducing that, that processing time. Great. So there's a couple questions that came in about precision agriculture and how it can help with that industry. Um, one of them is how can they apply deep learning for weed detection in agriculture? Sure. I mean, it, at, the, at the very least, there's the concept of uh, uh, drone footage of, of crops in a field and uh, being able to train a neural network to identify what's a plant, what's a, what's a weed, purely from, from a visual information. I, I don't think that that would be a challenge. Going beyond that certainly can bring in other modalities, uh, such as hyperspectral type of data to, to make a, 
know, more advanced decision, tie those together um, and make a synergistic decision. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Great. Um, so this one um, is similar in the industry, but do you use it or can they use it for medical imaging? It, it has been. There, there are um, there are a variety of uses in that. If, if um, a search of the academic paper, still quite a few people taking a look at automatically detecting uh, cancer cells in uh, radiographs that could not be detected or easily missed by the, the radio text. Uh, seeing a lot of success there, but it, you know, at its heart, it's still a, a uh, find a specific signature in an imagery type of problem. So it, yes, it absolutely can be applied to uh, medical imaging. We have not been doing that, not not in our uh, specific um, uh, area, but it, it it is documented well in the academic community. Okay, the next question. Can we employ deep learning technique in combination with an object-based image analysis technique for classification? I would want to know a little bit more about that, but in general, yes, it goes into the, the concept of tying together multiple uh, data types. Uh, we certainly have experience in uh, in feeding multiple input sources into a neural net. Um, I, I keep saying synergistic decision, but that, that's the concept there, is being able to make a decision based off of multiple sources better than you can make off of uh, individual sources. Um, so generically, I would say yes there. Great, thank you. With that, we're going to wrap things up here. If we didn't get to your question, then someone will follow up with you. Um, and just a reminder that there will be a recording of this webinar, as well as the PDF of the presentation will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. It will also be available online at www.harrisgeospatial.com. And we encourage you to share it with your colleagues. We appreciate everyone's attention on the line. And thank you again, Will and Pedro, for the great presentation.